study entailed pooled data, meaning data from both of our studies, uh, phase two and phase three clinical trials, and then looked at how tepratumumab affected thyroid eye disease in a subgroup of populations. And I, and I think what this really helps to understand is that tepratumumab was highly effective in all genders, uh, both in uh, race and also age. Uh, and so I think that it really just helps to show just how useful this drug is for the treatment of thyroid eye disease. Thyroid eye disease is a disease where the immune system attacks the tissue around the eyes. So it causes the eyes to actually bulge forward and for the face to be completely disfigured due to the swelling that occurs around the eyes and the face. And then also there could be loss of vision. So really this drug allows us to treat that disease because previously none of the other therapies reversed this disease. Instead, we had to resort to surgical therapy and actually drilling behind the eye around the bone between the eye and the brain to actually relieve the, you know, some of the issues of this disease. So this drug really is kind of a revolution for us as far as the treatment of the disease, because now medically we can decrease the eye bulging in so many aspects of this disease that just couldn't be treated previously without major surgery. It was a group as smokers versus non-smokers that we were particularly interested because in particular, this disease seems to be much worse in smokers. So we really wanted to have a sense as to whether, whether you smoked or not, whether this drug was effective. And it was highly effective in both groups, which is very reassuring that it can really be used across the board for many types of patients. Well, I think that, you know, the next steps, um, you know, again, these were two, uh, two really great trials where the data was pooled. But I think the next steps are, you know, now that this is commercially available, is to seeing how it impacts patients in real life. Um, a kidney clinical trial uses a very small subset of patients. And, and what we really want to see is how this impacts patients who potentially are much further on in the disease process and how it affects patients more broadly. So we'll really be looking at that very closely in addition to safety. This drug was incredibly well tolerated by patients. So in the future, we're gonna just make sure that that safety um, issues that we saw are, remain to be very small and well tolerated and that that carries through to a larger population. Yeah, so, so COVID-19, you know, is, is something that is uh, new in one respect for us and that it's a new version of a virus, but we have a little bit of an idea of how these things are transmitted and they are transmitted across mucosal surfaces of which the eye and the mouth and tissues are, are you know, are some of those. So we are particularly sensitive, you know, about any type of surgery or manipulations of the eye. Fortunately, you know, as far as this drug is concerned, there really aren't any manipulations such as you would see in ophthalmology or in surgery around the eye. So this drug can be given as an infusion. Now, the drug targets the IGF-1 receptor, and right now we have really no data that shows that there's any clinical effect upon the immune system. In the trials that we completed, the rates of infection or were identical, and there was no increased risk of opportunistic infection. So right now, it really appears that, you know, not necessarily patients are any higher risk, but you still have to really establish the risk and benefits from patients coming in and getting treated at this time. And that's where individual practitioners, I think really just have to have a risk and benefit of the urgency of treating patients during this uncertain time. It's always, you know, I, I think really rewarding, especially when, you know, someone like myself, I've worked in this field in the basic science of, of this disease for the last 15 years. So you always want to present data that you really feel is a landmark study moving forward. And so for us, I, I think that was, you know, a, a disappointment, you know, in really spreading the word to our colleagues about new innovation in this disease that's really been stagnant for so long. 
and that there is a new drug that's available and it can be used and it's very well tolerated. So, so I think for us, that was the largest disappointment of not being able to reach on a personal level, the colleagues that you know, we so admire and that will be using this medication. Absolutely. In fact, for recruiting this trial, 90% of the patients that I recruited to my two centers personally were screened via telehealth or telemedicine. And 95% accuracy as far as screening patients, as far as their acceptability to undergo the trial. So what I think we can take from it is that we can actually learn uh, quite a bit about patients both their, even on an initial consult, but also for following via telehealth. And it can be a really great and useful tool. In fact, it's something that I think, um, hopefully of this whole situation, that will be something that we take away and can expand upon moving forward, because it really is something that I think patients appreciate um, because they're in the safety and comfort of their home. And they also feel much more comfortable and can, it, and can really relate to you know, some of the questions that we're asking and many of the, the trial parameters, at least you know, for, this, for this procedure, for this trial.